Are you guys ready? Five minutes. I have a lot of things, and I'm going to rapid, rapid fire through them. <clears throat> so do your best to, you know, scribble down your notes. Hopefully your other tribe members are also taking notes. So if you miss something, they got something, right? This is where it's important to work as a team. Are you guys ready? I'm about to start my timer. Are you guys ready? Yeah. I need a little bit more excitement, a little bit more energy. Are you guys ready? Yeah. Okay. All right. This is about Jacob. Let's go. Okay. Jacob was the grandson of Abraham. Grandson of Abraham. Son of Isaac. He was the son of Isaac. The stories about Jacob in the Bible start in Genesis chapter 25, verse 19. Genesis 25, verse 19. Jacob was a twin. Jacob was a twin. He was the younger brother to Esau. Everybody say Esau. Esau. Younger brother to Esau. E-S-A-U. E. S A U. They did have some weird names. But I'm sure they would think some of our names are weird now. During their birth, this is a crazy fact. During their birth, Jacob was holding onto Esau's heel. So think about how crazy this is. These are twins. Is anybody here a twin? Does anybody know twins? Okay, we we all know a twin. During the birth, he was literally holding his brother's heel. While they're being birthed. Crazy to think about. But it ties into who he was later. Jacob stole Esau's birthright by trading him stew. I'm going to say that one again. This is a big deal. Remember, he's the second brother. Esau was born first. And Jacob stole Esau's birthright by trading him stew. Jacob stole Esau's blessing by dressing up like him and tricking their father, Isaac. Jacob stole Esau's blessing by dressing up like him and tricking their father, Isaac. After stealing Esau's birthright and blessing, Jacob fled. Pretty understandable. He just stole everything from his brother. His brother wants to kill him, so he says, I'm out of here. Okay? So after stealing Esau's birthright and blessing, Jacob fled. Jacob received a revelation from God that the promise given to his grandfather, Abraham, would continue through him. So shorthand, you could just put, God promised Jacob the same covenant as Abraham. The same promise. And this is what the promise was. The blessing of all nations and people would come through this family. It would come through this family that God would bless all people in all nations. The place Jacob had this revelation or had this realization He named Bethel. The location is named Bethel. Jacob moved in with his uncle Laban. So when he fled, he moved in with his uncle Laban. And if you thought the names were weird, just wait for this. Jacob fell in love with his cousin Rachel. Jacob fell in love with his cousin Rachel. Now, they're not from Alabama, but it's close. (laughs) Jacob worked for Laban, his uncle, for seven years to obtain Rachel's hand in marriage. So here's the key points. Jacob worked for seven years for his uncle to get Rachel's hand in marriage. The agreement was this, and this is how they did it back in the day. The agreement was, hey, I think your daughter's beautiful. I would like to marry her. And the father would be like, well, what are you going to give me for, the, for her hand in marriage? And he said, I'll work for you for seven years. That was the agreement. How many years? Seven. How many? Seven. Gentlemen, I, I just want to, I'm, I'm going to pause my timer real quick, right? Some of you think you like the girls that you like right now. How many of you would be willing to work for their dad doing whatever they told you to do for seven years before you were ever able to date her or, or marry her? How many? Gentlemen, show of hands. Yeah? Listen, some of you won't even pick up your room for your own parents. I doubt it, okay? You won't even wash the dishes. Let's keep it real. Okay. 
At the end of seven years, Laban tricked Jacob by sending his oldest daughter, Leah, in on the wedding night. I'm telling you, this stuff is getting crazy. Hope you're taking notes. This is all in your Bible. I'm not making this stuff up. Who here has ever thought the Bible was boring? My hand was up. I, I, I once thought the Bible was boring. And then I, then I started reading it. And I realized, hey, this isn't boring. This is better than any reality TV show I've ever watched on TV. You think keeping up with the Kardashians is crazy? Read your Bible, okay? Read your Bible. There are some crazy stories in here. There's a lot to learn from these crazy stories. It shows just how broken people are. Because here's the reality. I'm broken. You're broken. People are just broken. And so broken people do broken things, crazy things. And so here's the reality. I'm going to share that fact again. So the promise was if you work for seven years, you would be able to marry the daughter, Rachel. But Rachel was the younger daughter, and the practice back then is that the older daughter would be married off first, right? Leah was the older daughter. Laban tricked Jacob. So this is what you should write down. Laban tricked Jacob and switched Leah for Rachel. Yes, I know. There, there is a Leah. There is a Leah. Let's, let's, get a, let's get a laugh out now. Ha, 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 ha. There is a Leah. Leah, I'm sorry they're so immature. Everybody apologize to Leah that we can't laugh. Sorry, Leah. You're welcome. Okay. Now, listen, I'll separate that group over there, too. I'm not scared. Okay, let's focus. Laban tricked Jacob, sending in the oldest daughter, Leah, on the wedding night. Okay, next thing. Jacob had to work seven more years to get Rachel's hand in marriage. Seven more years to get Rachel's hand in marriage. Jacob served Laban six more years. So seven years, and then he got tricked. Seven more years, and then after he got Rachel's hand in marriage, he served six more years. He spent many years of his life working and serving Laban. Yes, exactly, 20 years. Okay, on his way back home to Palestine, Jacob wrestled with God. This is a big one. So after the 20 years, he, he knows he needs to go back because the promise that God made... He, if it was going to be fulfilled, he needed to go back. He needed to go back home. He needed to restore things with his brother Esau. And so after the 20 years, Jacob was on his way back to Palestine. Everybody write this down. Jacob wrestled with God. Jacob wrestled with God. Jacob's name was changed by God to Israel. So his name was Jacob. And after wrestling with God, his name was Israel. Israel means wrestle with God. Israel means wrestles with God. Jacob had 13 children by four women. Write these numbers down. 13 children by four women. I told you, if you thought your Bible was boring, read it. He had 12 sons and one daughter. 12 sons and one daughter. Jacob's 12 sons became the heads of the 12 tribes of Israel. That sounds familiar now, doesn't it? That's 12 tribes. Okay, tribe of Reuben, where are you at? Anybody here from the tribe of Reuben? Show a hand real quick. Okay, we got some hands. We got some hands. Reuben, I'm going to go through the children very quickly, so take notes. Okay, and here's the encouraging thing. If you miss anything, all you have to do is pick this up and read it, because I didn't get anything from, from any other source except the Bible. Okay, Reuben was born first. His mom was Leah. Simeon, born second. His mom was Leah. Levi, born third. His mom was Leah. Judah, born fourth. The mom was Leah. Leah was barren after Judah, meaning she no longer could have kids after Judah. Dan was born fifth. His mom's name was Bilho. Dan was born fifth. His mom was Bilho. If you don't know it, 
If you can't write it down, I promise you, you can find it in your Bible. Bilhel was Rachel's maid. Naphtali was born six. Same mom. Mom was the same mom as Dan, Rachel's maid. You'll find out when you read your Bible. Gad was born seventh. His mom was Ziphel. This is Leah's maid. Asher was born eighth. His mom was the same. Ziphel, Leah's maid. Itzikar was born ninth. Leah was the mom. She was able to have kids again. Zebulun was born tenth. The mom was Leah. Dinha, the eleventh child, was the only daughter. The mom was Leah. Joseph was born twelfth. Mom was Rachel. Benjamin was born 13th. Mom was Rachel. Jacob had seven children with Leah. Jacob had two children with Rachel. Jacob had two children with Bilhel. Jacob had two children with Zephil. Jacob lived to be 147 years old. 147 years old. Okay, I went way over five minutes, but I feel good about it. Now, let's get into it. Let's get into it. Okay, who has their Bible? Flip to Genesis. Very early on in your Bible, you should probably only have to flip a couple of pages. Genesis, we're going to be in chapter 32. Everybody say 32. 32. That seemed like a struggle for some of us. Genesis 32. Thank you, Elijah. Appreciate you. We're going to be in verses 22 through 32. 22 through 32. There's a lot of stories I could have focused on when talking about Jacob. As you could see from the fun facts, right? Like there was a lot that took place. He was born holding his brother's heel. They, they were essentially wrestling for position back and forth their whole childhood. The significance of being born first for Esau meant that he was going to get the birthright and the blessing. The birthright being that he was going to be the one. Think about this promise that God made with Abraham, that all nations and all people were going to be blessed through him and his Family. Being the firstborn son would have meant that that birthright would have been passed on to him. So it would have been Esau that we were talking about now, but rather it's now Jacob. So it was a big deal that he pulled this switcheroo on his brother for, for Stu, nonetheless, right? And you can look at Esau and say, man, you're so stupid. Why would you trade that away for some food? But let me tell you this. This is the reality. Like, I, I'm, I'm going to be real with all of us. We all give in to our, our cravings way more than we would like to realize, and it always costs you more than you ever thought it would. I'm going to let that sit for a second. We all give into our cravings and our appetites way more than we should, and it always costs you more than you ever thought it was going to. We all do it, and it's not just with food. It could be how we talk to people, it could be doing things that we know we shouldn't be doing. It should be watching things we know we shouldn't be watching. Using things we know we shouldn't be using. We all give in to those temptations. We all give in to our hunger and our appetites way more than we should. But Esau got tricked. But he also tricked Esau and his father out of the blessing that Esau would have gotten. And here's the other thing. Being the firstborn son... With a patriarch society, being the firstborn son meant that all of the family wealth, the majority of it, would be given to you, but all of it would be like under your leadership. The, the family business, all, all of the stuff, like all of it would be under your authority, under your leadership, and Esau lost all of that. So I could focus in on those stories, and I'm telling you, there's a lot there. So this week and over the next couple of weeks, I challenge you. Stop scrolling on TikTok, stop scrolling on YouTube, all the other things that we fill our time with. Spend some time in the Bible. If you have to use the YouVersion Bible app because it reads to you, do it. But some of these stories are so crazy. Because they, they seem like because it happened thousands and thousands of years ago, it's not relatable. And just because some of the names are crazy to say, it, it's not relatable. But there's so much that's relatable. 
because these are real people who lived real lives and struggled and, and wrestled with making the right decision versus the wrong decision. And that's something that we all wrestle with, is it not? We all wrestle with that. We all wrestle with that. Yeah. None of us are perfect. None of us are perfect. Every single day we make mistakes. Every single day I make mistakes. There's a lot of mistakes he made. I would say that the, the decisions he made led to him having a broken relationship with his father, a broken relationship with his brother. He literally had to run away from his brother because his brother was going to kill him. So, so you may think that like you and your siblings may not like each other, but Esau was legitimately going to kill him. And so he had to run for his life. So decisions absolutely have consequences. They absolutely have consequences. So I could focus on that story, but, but I'm not going to. I could focus on the stories that, that took place with Laban, his uncle, and how crazy that whole family dynamic was. How he, he fell in love with his cousin, Rachel, but she was the younger daughter, so he got, he got tricked. He literally worked for seven years. Worked for seven years to, to win one daughter's hand in marriage, but then got tricked. The old switcheroo. And then worked seven more years to get the hand of the daughter that he wanted to marry in the first place. The one that he thought was beautiful. The one that he thought was worth it. I could even talk about how, how Leah must have just been heartbroken knowing that she wasn't the one that he wanted, but he was stuck with her. And for most of us, that's pretty relatable. You feel like people don't really want you around, but they just tolerate you. Can anybody relate to that? You're not the first pick. They only, they only have you around because they don't have a choice. But even in Leah's story, there's so many times where God just shows up and blesses her. Can I have that note? Thank you. Appreciate it. Even in Leah's story, there's so many times where God shows up and ministers just to her. So even within that, I want to share with you, when you feel alone, and you feel like you're the outcast. You feel like you're the one that nobody wanted, nobody picked. Leah's described as having weak eyes, right? That's the Old Testament way of saying she was ugly. Right? So even if you're here today and you feel like, man, I'm not pretty as the other people. I'm not as good looking as the other people. I'm not the person that people would choose first. Just know that even in that, God still ministered to Leah, still blessed her, still gave her a life that, that she couldn't even comprehend. But the story that I want to I sit in for the next couple of moments is when Jacob wrestles with God. So like I said, Genesis 32, verses 22 through 32. It says this. The same night he arose and took his two wives and his two female servants and his 11 children and crossed the ford of the Jabbok. He took them and sent them across the stream and everything else that he had. And Jacob was left alone. And a man wrestled with him until the breaking of the day. When the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, he touched his hip socket, and Jacob's hip was put out of joint as he wrestled with him. When he said, let me go, for the day has broken, Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. And he said to him, what is your name? And he said, Jacob. Then he said, your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, for you have striven with God and with man and have prevailed. Then Jacob asked him, please tell me your name. But he said, why is it that you ask my name? And there he blessed him. So Jacob called the name of that place Peniel, saying, for I have seen God face to face, and yet my life has been delivered. The sun rose upon him as he passed Penu, limping 
because of his hip because of his hip therefore to this day the people of Israel do not eat the sinew of the thigh that is on the hip socket it's like the tendon because he touched the socket of Jacob's hip on the sinew of the thigh i just want to read one portion one more time it said and a man wrestled with him until the breaking of the day When the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, he touched his hip socket, and Jacob's hip was put out of joint as he wrestled with him. Then he said, let me go, for the day has broken. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. And he said to him, what is your name? And he said, Jacob. Then he said, your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, for you have striven with God and with man and have prevailed. Then Jacob asked him, please tell me your name. But he said to him, but he said, why is it that you asked my name? And there he blessed him. All of Jacob's life, he was looking for blessings. And he was doing everything in his power to try and obtain blessings that weren't even his. That's relatable for a lot of us. For a lot of us, we live our lives wanting what other people have. Not realizing that what we have is what God has given us for a reason. And for so many of us, we legitimately live our whole lives focused on other people and their blessings and the things that they have and the things that we don't have. Like, this is legitimately Jacob's story. From birth, he was wrestling with other people. He legitimately was holding on to his brother's heel. Wrestling for position within the womb. Not even like a day old wrestling for blessing. And his whole upbringing, his whole childhood early adult years, he is wrestling for position and he's wrestling for blessing. He's wrestling to get what his brother has. That becomes his identity. Becomes who he's known for and what he's known for. He's known as the trickster who got what he got by tricking his brother. And it ruined relationships. It literally led him to this place of where he had to run away. It's what he was known for. It's what his identity was. And I want to just sit there for a second. Because you guys are at a a perfect age of where you you can have your life go one of two ways. You're at the perfect age. Because right now you're starting to get responsibilities like some of you have jobs. Some of you have responsibilities. Some of you have, you know, things that you're actually like required to do, right? Like you guys are no, it's no longer Rev Kids, right? Like we talk about it. This is Rev Youth. You are teenagers. Some of you have just entered into that, right? Like you're in sixth grade. You're you're still figuring out what it means not to be a kid. Some of you are months away from graduating high school. And it felt like yesterday that you were in sixth grade or freshman year of high school at least. And some of you are are like legitimately months away from like stepping into adulthood, stepping into what, you know, everybody says is the real world. But all of you are perfectly positioned right now to make a decision that your future and your life, your future family, your future job, all of that stuff is going to be under this relationship with God You're going to put it in his hands and you're going to trust him. Or you can fall into the trap that so many of your peers, so many of your leaders, myself, fell into and fall into, which is I'm going to strive for everything the world says is good. You guys have that opportunity right now. The decisions and the choices that you guys make right now will impact your future. And I'm here to tell you, it doesn't make life any easier, but it makes everything worth it 
when you have a relationship with God and you put God first. It doesn't make life any easier, but it makes it worth it. You can have peace that surpasses understanding here and now and know without a shadow of a doubt that when it's all said and done and you take your last breath here on earth, you will spend all eternity with the God that created you in heaven where everything is perfect. Back to the Garden of Eden that we talked about with Adam in in the first message of this series. Back to where things were perfect. So Jacob was known for one thing. His identity was built into striving after what everybody else had, wrestling with other people, trying to swindle his way into positions and power. And here, on his way back, on his way back home, where he should have been, on his way back home, he wrestles with God. Guys, we can't miss how significant that is. We can't miss it. He had this crazy encounter where he legitimately wrestled with God. And you know the cool thing about it? This fighting spirit that he had, it showed up in this wrestling match with God. Because he said, I will not let go. He would not let go. He was a fighter. He wasn't a quitter. And God will use that. In the Hebrew culture and in the Jewish culture, they call it chutzpah. Like he had chutzpah. He had something about him that said, I'm not a quitter. I'm going to fight until I die to get what I want. And for him at this point in his life, it was to be blessed. Do you notice that while he's wrestling with God, he's asked, what do you want? What is it going to take for you to let me go? And he says, I want you to bless me. I'm not going to let you go until you bless me. Do you see how his identity and his worth and everything that he is is still wrapped up in this reality of I just want to be blessed? And God uses that chutzpah, uses that, that fighting spirit that he has, that, that energy that he has to, to reach and, and grab for the things that he would want. And God uses it, but in a way that he never thought. Because God didn't bless him with money or status. He didn't bless him with things going perfectly for the rest of his life. He actually walked with a limp for the rest of his life after this encounter with God. I think it was just a reminder. Every single step he took where he had to limp it out, every single day, just a reminder of, I wrestled with God. God didn't bless him in the way that you would think a blessing would be. But the way that God blessed him is the most amazing way to be blessed. And here's the crazy thing. It's available to each and every one of you today. God changed his name. The blessing that Jacob got was God giving him his real identity. And so there's some of you who are in here today where you have absolutely no idea who you are. You can put on the show. You can pretend. But on the inside, you wrestle with who you are, your worth, your identity. And it doesn't help that culture is literally attacking you guys and everyone from all angles when it comes to identity and worth and purpose. But we say it all the time here, you were created on purpose for a purpose. And to say that statement, you were created on purpose for a purpose, we have to acknowledge the fact that God created you. So here's the reality. God created you, and because God's the one who created you, he's the one who can tell you who you really are. And so all the lies you've been told your whole life, all the lies that you've believed your whole life, all the different identities that people have put on you, all the different things that people have said about you and to you, The one who gets the final say is God because he's the one who created you. He knows who you really are and who you were really created to be. You guys realize how significant that is? God wants to set some of you free tonight because some of you are bound up in this identity crisis. Some of you don't know who you are. 
Some of you don't know your purpose and your worth. But God wants you to. God wants you to know that he loves you and that he created you on purpose for a purpose. And it doesn't matter how many mistakes you've made in your life because can we admit, Jacob made a lot of mistakes. It doesn't matter how many mistakes you've made in your life, how many times you've fallen short and how many different labels have been put on you. When God says this is who you are, everything changes. And so today, you can have that experience. And I can tell you personally, my whole life changed when I had this reality. I didn't physically wrestle with God in the way that Jacob did, but man, I emotionally and I spiritually wrestled with God because I was at a, a pivotal point of where I was either just gonna be a, a nosedive into like depression and anxiety because I didn't know who I was and I didn't know my worth and I didn't know what I was gonna do. But it was in that where God stepped in and said, listen, first and foremost, I created you and I wanna have a relationship with you. And when you, when you put your faith in my son, Jesus, you now become a, a, a son of God. You become a child of God. And that literally changes everything. Because the identity that I have found in everything else was stripped away. In the same way that Jacob's identity in everything else was stripped away. You can have that experience today. And so my prayer and my hope is that you guys wouldn't just come to youth because your parents drop you off. And you wouldn't just come to youth because your friends are here. that you would come to youth because you know that God created you. And as you continue to wrestle with God, meaning you continue to, to seek his wisdom and his guidance, seek him for your identity, seek him for your worth. That's what it means to wrestle with God. Your whole life will change. That's my prayer, and I know that's the leader's prayers. So many mistakes in my life and in the leaders' lives could have been avoided if we stopped wrestling with people and the world and we just wrestled with God. We went to God for our identity. We went to God for our worth. We went to God for our purpose. But it's a choice. It's a choice to choose God. And so your one point, the one thing that I want you to write down is this, the biggest blessing is knowing who God says you are. Jacob was looking for blessings, and the blessing that God gave him wasn't what he was expecting. But it's everything he needed. And many of you are at a, a stage in life of where you want all the stuff and things. And you see what other people have, and you want it. And you see the money, and you see the fame, and you see the glory, and, and you want it. You see the relationships, and you want it. You want to be blessed. The biggest blessing is knowing who God says you are. And if you're here today and you don't know who God says you are, I challenge you, press into that. After service, come to me. Come to a leader. We'll share our experiences and we'll share the truth. God says you are a loved child of his he is your heavenly father. That's the relationship he wants. He wants you to put your faith in Jesus, his son who died on a cross in your place so that you could come to know that identity and have confidence in that identity. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you so much for today. God, I thank you that you work in mysterious ways in a situation and circumstances, God, where Jacob could have easily ruined his whole life by striving after what other people had and making deals and trades that were less than honorable. God, you redeemed him. God, I pray for every single student that's here today. 
that there would be a shift spiritually for them, Lord. Where they would stop playing games and they would get serious. Lord, that they would find their identity and their purpose in you. God, I'm grateful that there is story after story, individual after individual that we can read about to see that you use broken people. People who make mistakes and are messed up just like us. God, you use them time and time again. And I pray that that would just open up our eyes to the reality that that means you can use us too. It means you want a relationship with us too. It means you haven't given up on us. It doesn't matter how far we are from you right now. All it takes is one moment where we say, God, I have drifted from you. God, I want a relationship with you. God, I believe that the way to have that relationship is believing that Jesus, your son, died on a cross and defeated death by resurrecting. That he now sits at the right hand of you. God, in that through making that decision of faith, through putting my faith in Jesus, everything changes. I'm no longer an orphan who doesn't have a family and is wandering through life alone. I am now a child of God. You set a place before me in the presence of my enemies. God, you are good. You are loving. You don't want me to go through this whole life of mine wandering and searching for purpose and hope. But God, you provide things that we couldn't even imagine. So God, I pray for any student that's here today that they would make that decision. They would have their lives radically transformed. That they would be able to look back at today and see that things are never the same. It doesn't mean life is going to be easier. It just means that they now have your guidance and your wisdom to navigate through the difficulties of life. And God, that they would be blessed in ways they never thought were possible. God, I thank you for the privilege that it is to lead this youth ministry. I thank you for the leaders, and I thank you for each and every student that is here. God, I pray that for each and every student there would be a shift, whether this is their first time or they've been coming for months or years. God, that there would be a fire stirring up in their hearts to grow and to having a deeper relationship with you. Because, God, the spiritual warfare is real. The battles are real. On some level, each and every one of us are, are battling with things that nobody else knows about. So God, we give those things to you. We trust you. We honor you. And we know that you are the King of kings, the Lord of lords. And every knee will bow to the name of Jesus. And God, we're just grateful that we are in your family. And we can bow from this place of excitement and gratitude rather than out of fear and regret. God, we thank you. We love you. We pray all this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen.